Amen. Thank the Lord for the good singing today. I'll tell you just the privilege of being able to worship the Lord and uh, serve the living Christ. Have a copy of the Word of God. I want you to turn, uh, first of all, to the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 7. Begin reading in verse 22, and then we're going to turn back to the second chapter of the book of Exodus. But there's one phrase here that it doesn't say in Exodus that I want us to look at just a moment. Acts 7, 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. And this is what I want you to notice. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now, remembering that verse, if you turn back to the second chapter of the book of Exodus. Verse 13, and he went, out of the sec- he went out the second day, and behold, two men, the Hebrews, strove together, and he said to them that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, who made thee a prince or a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is made known. Now, <clears throat> Let's look at verse 11. And it came to pass in those days that Moses was grown, he went out to his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now this morning as we again just uh, look briefly uh, at the life of Moses, as we begin to just touch some uh, highlights in the life of Moses as we've done the last few weeks, the last week we were here, uh, we talked about Moses coming to age and refusing uh, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, refused the throne, and identified himself uh, with the people of Israel, with his own brethren that were in slavery, that, were in, that was in bondage, and how that he rejected uh, the throne of Israel. And, you know, someone asked the question, and I asked it myself in studying, When Moses had opportunity to the throne, why in the world didn't he go ahead and take the throne and use that as a means to get Israel uh, out of Egypt? But whenever I began to really think and began to really look, because, you know, that would have been the logical way to have done it, wouldn't it? I mean, Moses could have been king and his interest was delivering and doing something for the children of Israel, basically doing something for them and delivering them uh, from the hand and from the oppression of the Egyptians. He could have taken the throne and done that. But there had been one problem in doing it. The children of Israel was already in Goshen, one of the most fruitful lands that there was in the world. And if Moses had taken the throne and actually relieved them of the oppressions and the burdens, there was no way in the world he would have ever gotten them out of Egypt. Do you believe that? I mean, they were reluctant to follow in all of the oppressions, all of the burdens, all of the trials, all of the conflict. I mean, all the while, what God was doing was bringing them to the place to force them to follow Moses. And had Moses relieved the burden and the oppression, you see, it really wasn't just the oppressions of Israel, uh, the oppressions of Egypt that God was wanting to deliver Israel from, but he was wanting to deliver them to something. Glory be to God for it. And Moses could have delivered them from the oppression and the bondage, but he couldn't have delivered them to something. The land of milk and honey would have had no attraction for them had they had the oppressions relieved and they had all the riches and wealth of, uh, of Egypt at their disposal. There would have been no attraction to have gone out 
and to journey to the land that was flowing with milk and honey. And God had a land for his people, and he had to get them out of Egypt before he could ever get them into the land that's flowing with milk and honey. And that same thing God got to do every one of us. First thing he's got to do is get us out of Egypt, the land of oppression, the land of bondage, the land of chaos, the land of confusion, the land of heartache, the land of cruelty. God's got to get us out of it in order to get us into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And most of the time what God does in that land, that land of bondage, that, that lost world, is God has to make us so miserable in it until we're looking for a way out. I mean, we have to get sick of ourselves, sick of our state, sick of, sick of what we are and what we have done and the lifestyle that we are living before Jesus has any attraction. Is that right or wrong? I mean, man's not sick of his lifestyle and sick of sin and sick of his way of living. Jesus doesn't have any attraction. You can preach Jesus all you want to, but Jesus, uh, he, uh, Jesus won't attract that man. But you take somebody that's at the road's end and rock bottom, and I'll tell you, they're sick of it. They're tired of the burden. They're tired of the load. They're tired of the yoke that there is upon them. And you take that individual that's sick of themselves and sick of their sins, and you show them a new way of life and say there's a brand new land, a land of milk and honey, a land of joy and victory. A land where that God can make you a new creation and you have a new citizenship and a brand new land, then Jesus becomes attractive to that individual. And so Moses had rejected everything and was ready to begin the great task of leading the children of Israel out. And the word of God declared that he went down to visit, uh, went out to visit his brethren. You know, uh, the children of Israel weren't living uh, around the palace where that Every day when Moses went out, whenever he was in the kingdom, that he could go out and look upon his brethren and see his brethren and fellowship with his brethren, but they were there in a distant land, in a different territory that had been set aside for them. And so Moses decided that morning to get up and to go out and visit his brethren. He'd already rejected it all in order to be identified with them. And when he got there, he saw a Hebrew that was whipping I thought he saw an Egyptian that was whipping and mistreating one of the Hebrews. And the word of the Lord said that Moses slew that Egyptian. So, and, and the word of God declared this, that he supposed that the Hebrews would have understood that they were going to be delivered by his hand. So really, Moses understood, like I said, I believe because of childhood training, Moses understood that he was a deliverer. Moses understood that he was God's man because I believe he'd been taught that as a child because of special revelation that his parents had. But now, at this point, God hadn't given Moses any orders. Moses knew by reason that he was the man, but he hadn't yet heard from God. He had only heard from his mother. She had told him right. So Moses in anxiety and in a hurry, I'll tell you what, that spirit that was so ready to move when he saw this Egyptian that was slaying a Hebrew, he began his ministry of deliverance. And he delivered that Hebrew from the hand of the Egyptian. Now, Moses undertook this in his own energy. It was Moses' plight and Moses' plan by his own hand to deliver the Egyptians. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do more than know simply what God's will is for a situation. We need to understand God's way and God's plan in doing his will. And so, could you imagine Moses going out to deliver the Egyptians and uh, he, he, he slew this Egyptian whenever he saw him mistreating the Hebrew. Uh, how many years would it have ever taken him to have killed the Egyptians one at a time and uh, delivered this one from the oppression and that one from the oppression through the images of the flesh and the work of the flesh? He could have never, never done it. Yet, 
I believe Moses' intentions was right. I even believe Moses' heart was right about the whole situation. But the whole problem was he got ahead of God. And you know the most difficult thing in the world to do is to wait on God. You know, if you know God wants you to do something, the most difficult thing in the world is to wait on the Lord. It's difficult in the church to wait on God. You know, what we want to do if we're not careful, we want to get ahead of God. And so what happened? Moses slew the Egyptian, and the word of God declared that whenever he did, and I want us to look at it just a moment, that, that uh, a couple of things about it that would let us know uh, some of the evidence of the fact that he wasn't really listening to the Lord. You know what it was in verse 12? And he looked this way and he looked that way and he saw that there was no man. Now, the truth of the matter, had Moses had a word from God, he wouldn't have had to look this way and he wouldn't have had to look that way. Right or wrong. It wouldn't have made any difference about the opinions of men if he had heard the voice of holy God. So it was evident, in, even in Moses' life, that he hadn't heard from God because he began to look this way and he began to look that way because of the fear of man. And one thing Moses had to be delivered from and everybody else has got to be delivered from, if they're ever going to be God's man or God's woman in God's hour, they have got to be delivered from the fear of man. What does man think about a situation? Doesn't make any difference. What God thinks about it is the only thing in the world that makes any difference. In fact, I find in the scripture where the majority has never been right. You ever think about that? Because there was always a select few that dared to listen to the Holy Ghost of God and had to stand against the tide of their day to ever do the will of God. And so Moses went out, he saw his brethren, and he got ready to perform the work of God in his own strength, and he looked this way and he looked that way to see if anybody was looking, to see if anybody could accuse him, to see if anybody could pin the offense on him. And that was dead giveaway that it wasn't the will of God. Folk, any time we've got to look this way and look that way, there's a problem with what we're doing, right or wrong. If we've got to listen to who's listening before we say it, we, just, we ought not say it. If we've got to look around to find out who's going to see us, it would probably be a pretty good principle to say, well, if I've got to find out who's looking, I'd just be better off not to do it. Right or wrong. And so that fear was in Moses. And he slew the Egyptians. He, you know, he thought, he didn't think anybody knew anything about it, basically, that would have caused him any problem. While the Hebrews, he supposed that they would have understood that he was going to deliver them. But they didn't understand it. He supposed that they would have. I mean, Moses had been taught and trained and schooled in the fact that he was the deliverer, and he supposed that they all knew. Why, didn't they know that he had rejected the throne to deliver them? Didn't they know that he had rejected the riches of Egypt? Didn't they know that he had, that he had rejected prestige and popularity and power and all that he might be able to deliver them, and now he's come to do his job? Why, shouldn't there have been a great welcome to welcome Moses to their deliverer to have delivered them? Strange, wasn't it? And Moses, the word of God said in chapter 3, verse 1, and Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father, father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mount of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, we know what happened after Moses slew the Egyptian. The word of God said that Moses, began to, that Moses fled for his life because he feared Pharaoh. And he went to the backside of the desert. And on the backside of the desert, there he, he, he married uh, one of the priest's daughters. And actually had been 40 years on the backside of this desert doing nothing but tending sheep. Could you imagine that? Here's a man with a college education. I mean a degree from the University of Egypt. 
Here was a man with rank. Here was a soldier. As I said, histor uh, the historians tell us in Josephus' writings were that Moses was one of the greatest soldiers of his day that whenever uh, Egypt was threatened, led them to triumph and to victory and brought back the spoil of the enemy and folk honored him and recognized him as a great soldier. Moses was a great statesman. The scripture said he was mighty in words as well as in deeds. Words of statement, deeds of soldier. And here this great statesman, this great soldier, here this man with such great education, with such great ability, runs because he kills an Egyptian in the images of the flesh and spends 40 years on the backside of a desert. He was 40 years old when he done it. And now, the next 40 years of his life was spent on the backside of a desert tending sheep. Boy, God has strange ways, doesn't he? I mean, he really does. 40 years. Could you imagine that? Moses get up in the morning and go out and the sun come up over the mountains and Moses sat there. You ever, you, do you ever imagine that Moses began to wonder in his heart as to whether or not he was really a fool? I imagine he did. See, Moses flesh and blood just like we are. Or I imagine the first year that he was there, the first week that he was there, the first month that he was there, that he probably felt like, well, you know, God's going to come down here in a whirlwind or God's going to visit Egypt in a whirlwind and there's going to be some great something happening and I'm going to go back and take over and lead the people out. But, you know, days come and days win. The same old thing, just tending sheep on the backside of a desert and nothing really happening in Moses' life. As far as external, I believe something was happening internally. I believe something was happening in his heart every day. I'll tell you one thing God did for him in 40 years. God ought to taught him patience. And that was the one thing that he lacked. I mean, he wasn't willing to wait on God to start with. And God took him to the backside of the desert and set him down for 40 years. I'd say that's a pretty good lesson, wouldn't you? 40 years on 40 years getting ready to do the job. Burn his life out in 15 seconds. And the backside of the desert, 40 years waiting to hear from God again. But all of a sudden, it was a memorial day in Moses' life. Moses got up that morning as he had other mornings. Sun came up as it had every other day. Same scenery, same sheep. Life is as it always was. And Moses got up to go out to that desert, take those sheep and to tend them another day after 40 long years. Moses, I imagine you have a bush that there was on that desert he should have after 40 years. Wouldn't you imagine that? Moses knew every strange sight. I can remember at home whenever we used to do just a little truck farming along with the dairy and, and uh, I'd go out a lot of times to irrigate the fields and row by row would turn the water down, sit there, it got to the end of the road, turn it back down another row. And you know, you'd sit there, it would seem like a, an eternity, but when you're just sitting there doing nothing before the water would ever get to the end of a row that was several acres long. And whenever you sat there on that headland, you know, it seemed like that you'd discover every rock. You looked at everything that looked a little strange, everything that looked a little unusual, and you played and tinkered with everything that there was around you. I've always been a little nervous and energetic myself when I got around work. And uh, Moses, for 40 years, folk, I imagine you have a bush and you have a rock, and you have a, I'll tell you, everything that was strange about that desert, and he got up and to go out that morning, and it was something different from what had ever been before. Moses looked out, and he saw a sight. It was a bush that was on fire. And fire always attracts, doesn't it? And Moses turned aside to see the sight. Now, folks, there was something most unusual about this burning bush that Moses saw. First of all, it was unusual that it was burning when Moses out there and he hadn't lit the fire. 
But there was something else more unusual about this bush. And you know what it was? It was burning, but it was not consumed. Right or wrong? You know the whole truth of the matter? It wasn't the bush burning. It was God in the bush. Right or wrong? And so God was burning and burning and burning in that bush, and the bush was not consumed. Major Iron Thomas said in his book on the saving life of Christ, he said, I imagine that whenever Moses saw that bush burning and burning and burning and not consumed, that God somehow used that bush to reveal to Moses his life. And Moses said, you know, I wish my life was like that bush. Well, that it would burn and burn and never be burned up. And Moses remembered how that he burned out his life in just a matter of moments whenever he killed that Egyptian in the energy of the flesh. And God taught Moses a great lesson, lesson here at this bush, and that was this. That if it's God in a man, it's God that does the burning and not the man. And therefore, the man is not consumed by the work of God, because it's at God at work in a man. And it's God that's burning in that man. And that man can burn and burn and burn and burn and never be consumed. Thought about some of the elderly men that I've known in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men like Oswald J. Smith, who was with us here whenever he was 80 years old, vigorous, great preacher of the gospel. Been preaching the gospel since he was a teenage boy, 50-something years whenever he was here. And then he preached on about another 12, 15 years after that. Preached the gospel for somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 years. How that he preached, and he preached, and he traveled over the world hundreds and hundreds of times. One of the greatest mission programs that the world has ever known. And he would stand and preach as an 80 or 85-year-old man and I'll tell you the glory of the Lord on him and the anointing of God and the broken spirit that he had that God had brought about through the years. And you know what you see? You see a man that's burning with God. And God burns in that man, but his ministry doesn't consume him. His ministry doesn't burn him out because it's not him that's burning, but it's God that's burning. Some time ago, Miss Bertha Smith was with us on Sunday morning, 90-something uh, years old. What was it? 98 when she was here. Can you imagine that, 98 years old? And stood here and spoke that morning, and a little senile, a man kind of wondering and rambling a little, and, but stood here in the pulpit and spoke about an hour and a half, and I'm convinced of the fact that if I hadn't stopped her, I would have spoke tonight. You know why? 98 years, 40 years on the mission field in China. Didn't burn her out. You know, I think of the contrast. I've seen folk that would go to the mission field and never serve the first time, come back after a year or two, totally burn out and give it up. Say, I just burn out. You know what happened? They should have never been burning to start with. Ought to have been God burning in their lives. Most of the missionaries that go to the mission, mission field never really stay their first term. Now, I saw some months ago how many men that leave the ministry every year. I'm talking about ba uh, Baptist preachers that leave the ministry every year. Absolutely, totally burned out. You know why they burn out? It's the bush burning and not God in it. Right or wrong? Burn completely out and give up and quit. And Moses saw this bush burning, but it was not consumed. And folk, that is the key of a life in Christ is whenever we can burn and burn and burn for God and never be consumed. Now, we notice when Moses saw the bush, it wasn't the bush that attracted Moses. It was the fire in the bush. Right or wrong? 
You know, there's bushes all over the desert and Moses wasn't pulling his shoes off at all of them. But there was something different and strange about this bush. It was the fire in the bush. And you know, uh, the whole truth of the matter, it didn't make any difference at all about the bush. God could have jumped in any bush and begun to burn and Moses would have turned aside and seen the sight. Major Thomas said this in, in The Saving life of, life of Christ, and it's probably been 15 years since I read the book, but I'll never forget what he said in regard to it. And I'll tell you, it made great impression on my life. He said this, he said, it doesn't make any difference about the bush. Any bush will do if God's a burning in it. In fact, the title of his subject in the book was Any Old Bush Will Do. And you know that is truth this morning. You may try to disqualify yourself in the service of the Lord in a fruitful, victorious Christian life and say, well, you know, that's for other people, but for me, you know, I'm different. But any bush will do. Big bush, small bush, skinny bush, a fat bush, an educated bush, an uneducated bush. Because it's not all of these side things that makes the major difference in the life. It's God that makes the difference. And God can burn in any bush this morning and folk turn aside to see the sight. Boy, isn't that encouraging? Isn't that encouraging that God burning in your life is the attraction this morning and not your life? That which God produces in you, that joy, that love, that meekness, that temperance, that long-suffering, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that God produces in you, that's what attracts people. That's what burns. And whenever God gets in our life and God begins to burn, Glory be to God, he can attract people. And I'll tell you, and the more he attracts, the more he burns, and the bush is not consumed because it's God that does the burning. He doesn't wear you out. He doesn't weary you. You shall run and not be weary. The word of God declared you shall mount up on eagle's wings because it's God in you. Not sapping you of your strength, but strengthening you. Not drawing from you, but filling you. Not burning your life out, but empowering your life. The fire of God in a life. That's what Moses saw in this bush. And the bush had a voice. God spoke. And called Moses... Verse 4, and when Moses saw it, he turned aside to see the sight, and God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. He knocked double on Moses' door, just didn't say Moses, but he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here am I. Now, folk, God is still speaking. The burning bush to you may be the silent page of the Word of God. It may be a track of encouragement. It could be the holy life of somebody that you've been watching for a long time that's spoken to your heart that there's something real and something genuine about Christianity. It could be a preacher of the gospel. It could be your Sunday school teacher. It could be a teacher in the classroom at school. God is still speaking. God is still calling. It could be through a gospel message. But God's speaking today. And the whole issue is, is whether or not when God speaks that you are attentive enough to listen. Moses was. And he said, draw not now hither, Pull off thy, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Moses could have said, Well, I thought at the foot of the altar 
was a place of holy ground, the temple, the sanctuary. It would be built for the glory and honor of God. I thought those would be the holy places. But you know what sanctifies a place? It's the presence of God. Right or wrong? You know what sanctifies a life? It's the presence of God. You know what sanctifies a church and makes it a holy place? Is the presence of God. I've been in places before where that meeting places where that I didn't necessarily think was sanctified grounds or holy places, even though they may have been called a church because there was no presence of God around. And it's God's presence, folk, that sanctifies. It's God's presence that makes a place holy. Now here Moses was out on the backside of the desert tending a bunch of sheep, standing at attention at a burning bush, hearing a voice from heaven say, The ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. It was a memorial day in Moses' life where that his course of life was going to be changed that day. Notice what Moses said. And he said, I am the Lord thy God, the, the, uh, the, the Lord, the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and the God of own God. You know, that's been one of the characteristics of every man that ever got in God's presence was they hid their face, right or wrong. You know, I think about even the seraphims, whenever... Isaiah hid his face from God and said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. It said that the, 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 the cherubims and the serpents with two wings did fly, with two wings did cover their faces. Why? Because God was there. And even the angels hid their faces from the presence of holy God. You know, every once in a while you hear folk talk about how they saw God and how Jesus floated up to them. And old Roberts, he saw, he saw Jesus, I think, 900 feet tall. Other seem and all oh, the butterflies that was in their stomach and how they floated around. But you know what I find in the Word of God, folk? When folk come in the presence of holy God, they hid their faces. The Word of God said that, the Word of God said that Joshua fell at his feet. John on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw the Lord, the Word of God said he fell as though he was dead. And Moses, whenever God spoke to him, Moses hid his face from God because he realized that he was standing in the very presence of deity. And I'll tell you, he realized he was unworthy to look upon God. And he realized that voice that he spoke was the voice of many waters. It was the voice of holy God, omnipotent God. And boy, Moses didn't dance into his presence. Moses realized that it was a holy, sacred, serious hour for him. And the word of God said that Moses feared and was afraid to look upon God. Three things I want us to notice about the God that spoke to him and how that God identified himself to Moses, and that'll be as far as we get today. First of all, he identified himself as the God of the past, the God of his fathers. He said in verse 6, And Moses said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid. Moses, we know, as we had said previously, had been taught the covenant that God had made with Abraham whenever God said to Abraham that your, uh, that your seed is going to be as numberless as the grains of sand on the seashore. And the book of Genesis, whenever God prophesied and God said and God foretold of the time whenever Israel was going to go into a land of bondage and was going to be taken captivity and would stay there for 400 years and then God prophesied and God foretold them that he was going to lead them out after 400 years and now that 400 years was up. And the first thing that God did to Moses was says, I'm the God of Abraham. Your mother told you about him. Your mother told you about the promises that I made to him. Your mother educated you in the fact that there was going to be a deliverer, Moses. At the point of, I am that God that made the promise. Your forefathers rested upon that promise. They believed that there would be a deliverance. They believed that there would come a day. And Moses, I am the God of that promise. 
I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. I am the God of the promise. And all the promises are yea and amen in me. He said, I'm the God of the past. But that wasn't necessarily sufficient for Moses. And then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmakers, and I know their sorrow, and I am come down. Hallelujah. He was the God of the present. God said, I heard their afflictions, I heard their cries, I heard their groaning, and God said, now I have come down. Hallelujah. Forty years before Moses started out, but God hadn't come down. Forty years before Moses tried to do the job, but God hadn't come down. But now, it's a vast difference, a vast difference. God comes on the scene. God comes down to fulfill his promise. God comes down to deliver his people. Not without a man. But a man couldn't do it without God. Moses, God said, I'm come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. And to bring them out of the land into a good land. And a large, uh, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites. And the Amorites. And the Perizzites and the Hiv Hivites, and the Jubasites. Therefore should the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Two things God said about them. God said, I've heard, and I've seen. And God can say the same thing about every man. You know, in the book of Revelation, over and over again, the word of God said, uh, in, in, the, in the second and third chapter, God said, I know thy works. I know thy works. Folk, God knows it all this morning. And God knows of your oppressions. God knows of your afflictions. God knows of your trials. God knows the predicament that you're in. God's heard your cries. You know, it's amazing. The children of Israel had been crying for years and years. And I imagine there were times that they wondered whether or not God was hearing. But God was hearing. God, I imagine there were times whenever they said, God, you said that you're going to deliver us and that we were your elect, that we were the very chosen of God. And God, uh, do you see what's happening to us here? God saw. He knew exactly what was happening. God let it happen for their benefit. He knew that the oppression had to get hard and had to get severe and he knew that the torture had to be unbearable in order to ever get them ready to move out of that land that they were living in that was the most uh, fertile land and the most productive land that there was in the world at that time. God knew that unless I'll tell you that things began to fall apart in their life that they'd never, never be willing to follow God. And God hears your cry. You say, well, preacher, I've cried out for days and years and he's done nothing. You're not ready yet. You say, but preacher, the, the oppression has become more severe. The, the suffering is getting worse every day. And my trials are getting uh, more and more and more. They're nearly unbearable. And I've cried out to God. It looked like God hadn't done anything. You're not ready yet. If God would deliver you, you'd soon be ready to go back. But God's waiting. And God has a time and a way to deliver you. You just need to be like Moses. You just need to be ever ready and attentive to hear the voice of God. You know, I don't know how much God had talked to Moses on the backside of the desert. There's no indication in the Word of God whether he said anything to Moses for 40 years. I imagine that 40 years Moses had asked a lot of questions. But now God's given him an answer. And so he was not only the God of the past, he was the God of the present. Moses not only needed to hear about a God of Abraham and a God of Isaac and a God of Jacob, Moses needed to know who God is and where God is and what God's doing right now for the situation that he's in. So he said, I am come down. 
Notice what else he said. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I just hadn't come down, but he said, I've come down to do something. I've come down to deliver them. Look at verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. He was the God of the future. God of the past, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the present, I am come down. The God of the future, I will send thee. He said, Moses, I'm the God of the past, I'm the God of the present. And I'm the God of the future. I'm the only God that ever has been, the only God that is, and the only God that ever will be. I am God. Moses, I will send thee. Send him where? Send him back to Egypt. Where did he left so afraid? Send him back to Egypt where he was on the most wanted list. Send him back to Egypt where he already had the death sentence upon him. I imagine Moses wondered, God, why can't you just get them to meet me out at the Red Sea? Why do I have to go back? There's a difference now. Moses is going back under the mighty hand of God. Moses is going back under supernatural direction. Moses is going back under the authority of the Holy Ghost. Moses is going back in the perfect will of God to accomplish a task for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. This was a memorial day in Moses' life. Forty years on the backside of a desert groaning and crying because of the affliction of his brethren. Folk, he had a burden for them. If he hadn't had a burden for them, he never would have forfeited and gave up everything that he had for his brethren. And he sat there 40 years with that burden for his brethren. And now God comes and God says, Moses, this is the day. It's a memorial day in your life. Things will never be the same for you again. I educated you in the school of Egypt for 40 years. I've taught you on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Moses, your training in Egypt uh, of a leader, your training, in, uh, your training in organization and all of that that you got back in Egypt is going to be a blessing to you. But Moses, did you just lived in the palace. You don't know nothing about the desert and nothing about the wilderness and nothing about survival. And so, Moses, I've trained you in this now for 40 years. Your life hadn't been wasted. You have been where I wanted you. You have been here under the training of the hand of holy God. And I have you prepared now, and I'm ready to use you. Would you be willing to give 80 years just for God to prepare you? Huh? Boy, most of us, we get ready to do something. I'll tell you, if God doesn't part Red Seas and River Jordans and rain manna out of heaven, we have prayer meeting one night, God doesn't part Red Seas, next day rain manna out of heaven, we look around and wonder where God was. Right or wrong? You start a ministry, would you be willing to spend 40 years just God preparing you for it? God preparing the work, God preparing the ministry? Lord, it seemed like I've been here three lifetimes, been here 23 years, what if I had to stay 40, you know, just for God to get us ready. And I'm convinced of the fact that if he make it 40, that he about have us ready. Moses. And Moses said, here am I. The whole issue this morning is this. You may have tried in the past and failed. Moses did. You may have tried to undertake and do God's work in the energy of the flesh and soon burn out. You may have tried and looked to the right and to the left to see what men thought and men said and you found that men were laughing and mocking and ridiculing because of your feeble efforts and you gave up and you threw in the towel. So did Moses. You may have just been sitting and waiting 
and thinking that there could never be any more for your life than what you have enjoyed the last years. Maybe something as boring as tending sheep on the backside of a desert, spiritually. But this morning, you may see a bush burning. Or not a literal bush. But spiritually this morning, you may can see a bush burning, and in that bush is God. And it's God that's doing the burning. And you may say, as Moses said, I tried and failed. I wish my life was like that bush, whether it could burn and burn and never be consumed. And you realize that the bush wasn't what attracted the sight, but it was God in that bush. Any bush would have done. And you realize that your life could be that instrument that God could inhabit this morning. Though you have failed, though you have sat on the sidelines, Though you may have mumbered and griped and complained about God's leading of your life and the lots that's befallen your path, you may say, I'm going to be like Moses. I'm going to say, here I am. God, here's another bush for you to burn in. I want my life to burn. But I don't want it to burn out like it has so many times before. I want it to burn and burn and burn. And God, I know to have that consistency, to have that commitment, to have that dedication, it's going to have to be you right in the middle of my life. Or otherwise, I'll burn out. I'll get tired. I'll quit. I'll give up. I can't burn in my own strength because my strength is soon gone. If it's my own life burning God, it'll be in ashes in no time. But God, I'm aware of the fact that you can inhabit my life, that you can take up your abode in my life. And God, if it need be like Oswald J. Smith when I'm 90 years old, I can still be burning for God. Or like Miss Brother Smith, I think she'll be 100 next year. She'll be speaking at the 100th anniversary of the, of the, of the WMU, of the Southern Baptist Convention. Her 100th birthday will be the 100th birthday of the WMU, and she's scheduled to speak to a hundred years old, still burning for God. You say, preacher, it means we're going to live a hundred? Does it mean we're going to live till we'll be 98 or 90 or 75 if God's a glowing in our life? No, but it does mean one thing. You will burn as long as you live. And I'm not interested in so much as how long I'm going to live is how I burn while I'm living. You'll burn as long as you live. William Brannard was only 28 years old. Missionary to the Indians in Canada, saw great revival. Gave his life those years ministering in sub-zero weather, exposure, it was said that there was times that they'd find William Brownham when the weather would be zero and it'd be snowed and he'd lay late in the woods so long. But oh, he so agonized and wrestled with God till the snow had melted around him. And he was laying down that wilderness praying for those Indians. Had his toe on his life. He died at 28, but he burned till he died. Biography left behind. And though he were dead, yet speaketh to challenge and encourage the lives of millions even after death. I think of like Evan Roberts that had the great revival, the Welch revival, only 22, 23 years old, and died at a very early age. If I'm not mistaken, I think Murray McShane died at about 30. I think of men like Curtis McCauley about 32 years old when God took him home. It wasn't how long he lived, but how he burned while he lived. And folk, he burned till he died. Folk at his church said he never preached a greater sermon than what he preached the Sunday before God took him home. He said he preached that Sunday as though he was in another world. 
But you ask not for a select few this morning. That's forever old backslidden Baptist in the country. It's right or wrong. When God begins to glow and burn in our life. You say, but preacher, when will he do it? Whenever you say as Moses says, here am I. Forgetting about what others do, forgetting about what others say, forgetting about how many join you, though none go with me, still I'll follow to say, here am I. I don't know what others will do, but to say to God, I'll live for you. I'll burn. Shall we bow our heads as we pray?